kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. But our friendship did not make our suffering any the less. I was chilled to the bone. I ached in every limb. I felt I should die unless we found warmth and shelter soon. Finally, my legs gave up. I could go no further. Alan reckoned that we must be close to the country of Balkhidhida. The braes of Balkhidhida were not the territory of one great clan. The people there bore many names. Some were fugitives. There were several MacGregors, kin to the famous outlaw Rob Roy. There were also some McLarens, who owed allegiance to the chief of Allen's people, the Appin Stewarts. With one final effort, I followed Allen down the bank of a raging stream. It brought us to a house, and Allen knocked at the door. The people were McLarens. We had found yet one more refuge. Allen left me and went to find a hiding place for himself. But during the weeks when I lay ill in bed, he visited me every evening. The news of our presence in Balquahida spread quickly among the people of the Braes. I was attended by the local doctor, and my visitors were many. There was even one of the wanted posters on the wall. I could see it from where I lay. It was a strange life for a wanted man. My host, Duncan Dewey McLaren, was a piper. Once I regained some of my strength, he would bring out his pipes of an evening, and often the music and laughter went on fine to the night. And not a single person made a move to betray us, even though there was a reward of a hundred pounds, and even though redcoat patrols were active in the country round about. I watched from my bed one day as a strong foot patrol and a party of mounted men went by, but they paid no heed to the scattered houses along the braes. One day, a new visitor came to the McLarens. He was Robin Oig McGregor, son of Rob Roy. He and Alan were old rivals, and Duncan Joyce suggested that they settle their difference with the pipes. Robin was known as a fine musician, and so, to my surprise, was Alan. Mrs. McLaren set out food and drink, while Alan and Robin sat themselves on either side of the fire. Turn about, they played. How they played. Never had music thrilled me so before. It was close to morning when Alan had to admit that Robin was the better of the two. Like us, Robin Oig McGregor was a fugitive, but a less fortunate one. Less than three years later, he was caught and hanged. Late in the summer, I was considered fit enough to travel. One last great barrier remained the River Forth. The main bridge was at Stirling, close by the castle and its garrison of redcoats. Alan thought it was now so long since the Appin murder that the hunt for us would have slackened, in which case our best plan was to take the most direct route to the lowlands by way of Stirling. We left Balquahida by night and two days later came by Strathaya, down out of the high hills and into the lowlands of the Castle of Stirling. The weather was warm, and we made camp upon a small island where a tributary flowed into the forth. All day we lay hidden, eating and drinking and listening to the sound of harvesters in the cornfields along the river. Not far off we could see Stirling Castle, and close under the castle was the bridge. We set off down river before the moon rose. There were lights in the castle and in the town but everything was quiet. As Alan had hoped, there appeared to be no guard on the bridge, a narrow, steeply rising stone structure. We crept as close as we dared, but could still see no sentry. But we could not see over the crown of the arch and decided to wait. Crouched in the shadow of a roadside dyke, we heard footsteps. An old woman was coming along the road, we heard her pass onto the bridge. The footsteps grew fainter. She was surely across by now. Then we heard a challenge. Who goes? And the rattle of a musket. The bridge was indeed guarded. What were we to do now? We had three shillings left, and between us and safety flowed a wide, swift river. Upstream, the fords and lesser bridges would also be guarded. 
So downstream we went, down towards where the river opened out into the Firth of Forth and the sea. All night we followed the shore, avoiding towns and villages. Dawn found us near the hamlet of Limekilns. On the opposite shore I could see Queensferry, where my adventures had started many weeks ago. And there was Mr Rankeela, the lawyer. He was the one hope I had of clearing my name and of getting Alan safely to France. But between us and Queen's Ferry, there was a wide stretch of water with ships at anchor and boats going to and fro. That's what we needed, a boat. At a small inn, we bought bread and cheese. The only person in the inn appeared to be the girl who served us. We'd only gone a few steps from the inn with the food when Alan stopped. I think that lass could get us a boat, he said. It's a pity you're not paler in the face. He went on as he led me back into the inn. Bewildered, I let him seat me in a chair. Then he ordered a glass of brandy and began to feed it to me in small sips. He broke the bread up small and did the same with it, as if I were a child or an invalid. Is he ill? exclaimed the girl. Ill? cried Alan. He has walked hundreds of miles and slept in wet heather. Has he no friends? Aye, he has, said Alan. But without a boat, he cannot reach them. And what's more? Here, Alan leaned forward and whistled softly a few notes. It was Charlie is my darling, a Jacobite song. The girl gasped. Is he? Indeed, said Alan. And with a price upon his head. With that, the girl brought a hot meal, refusing payment. I asked her if she knew of Mr. Rankeela, the lawyer in Queensferry. Not only did she know of Mr. Rankeela, but had heard very highly of him. More importantly, she was sure she could get us a boat. We hid for the rest of the day in a wood close to the beach. Night fell and the lights in the houses had long since gone out when we heard the sound of oars. It was the girl from the inn. Not daring to trust anyone else, she had taken a neighbour's boat. She was a sturdy lass, and before long we stood on the Lothian shore. We thanked her and bid her good night, and watched until she vanished in the darkness on her way back to Limekilns. I prayed that her exploit would go undiscovered. The penalties for helping wanted criminals were harsh. In the light of day, I made my way towards the town, while Alan remained hidden in the fields. I walked along the main street of Queensferry, ragged and filthy. The well-clad citizens of the elegant little burg gave me odd looks. I felt ashamed even to stop someone and ask for Mr. Rankeela. At length, I stopped to rest by a handsome house on the landward side of the town. A finely dressed gentleman came down the steps. Plucking up my courage, I asked for the house of Mr. Rankeela. This is it, he said, and I am he. From that moment, everything changed. I told him that I was David Balfour. He took me into the house and had me tell my whole story. As a lawyer, he would have nothing to do with anything illegal. To protect himself and others, he had me use false names. Clooney McPherson became Mr. Jameson and Alan was given the title of Thompson. I now discovered why my uncle had had me kidnapped. It seemed that Uncle Ebenezer was the younger son of the Balfours of Shores. When my grandfather died, Ebenezer stayed in the house of Shores to manage the estate. His elder brother, my father, went off to become schoolmaster of a remote border village. On his death, it was I, not Uncle Ebenezer, who was rightful Laird of Shores. I was a rich man, with lands and money in the bank. But what was I to do about Alan? Even if he were innocent of the murder of the Red Fox, he was still a wanted man as a Jacobite, among other things. But I could not abandon him now. It was Mr Rankeela who worked out a plan. But first, we had to deal with Uncle Ebenezer. Washed, fed and dressed in clothes belonging to the lawyer's son, I set off with him and his clerk as night fell. 
I took them to where Alan lay hidden and explained the plan. Then we walked on towards the House of Shores. While the rest of us hid in the shadows, Alan walked boldly up to the iron-studded door and knocked loudly, as I had done almost three months before. And again there was a pause. Then the upper window opened and Ebenezer Balfour of Shores appeared, complete with blunderbuss, and called, Who's there? Alan persuaded him that he had urgent business and that he had better come down and open the door. Uncle Ebenezer did so. Sitting on the top step and pointing the gun at Alan, he said, What's your business then? Alan told him that he was a partner of Captain Hoseason. Since the ship had been wrecked off Mull, David Balfour could no longer be sold as a slave in America. He was being held captive to be ransomed or killed. Which did Ebenezer prefer? Confused and frightened, Uncle Ebenezer blundered from one lie to another until, too late, he realised that he had been tricked into a confession. He had paid Ho Season to kidnap me and sell me as a slave in the Carolinas. At that, we stepped from the shadows. Good evening, Mr Balfour, said the lawyer. Good evening, Uncle, said I. Uncle Ebenezer said not a word. Still speechless, he let Mr. Rankeela lead him into the house. We followed. With speed and skill, the lawyer tied up the loose ends. Bringing Ebenezer Balfour before the courts would almost certainly put Alan at risk. He was also an old man, so it was agreed that he could live out his remaining years in the House of Shores but that the bulk of the money from the estate would be mine. The following day, Alan and I left the House of Shores and set out for Edinburgh. We shook hands and said goodbye on the outskirts. I went on into the city alone to arrange a safe and secret passage to France for Alan Breck Stewart. But that is another story.